Okay, welcome everyone. The, the presentation from Tudor and uh, the Barony of Lionsgate. Um, we'd like to acknowledge that um, Lionsgate is on the um, unceded lands of the Musqueam, Coast Salish, and Salatooth people. Um, I've just posted a link in the chat for registration if you'd like Tudor credit for this course. Um, I'd like to thank you um, for Nergoy for the tech support from Lionsgate and um, Madam Marguerite for teaching this episode. Um, take it away, Marguerite. Bonjour, mes amis. Uh, the, quest, the uh, class today is on persona development. This is a general overview. Essentially, what, what is persona development, how to do it, uh, all those fun and interesting things. One thing, uh, first thing to need to know is uh, your persona does not have to reflect your real life. You can be from any culture and any time period covered by the SCA. In the SCA, this is usually from 600 CE to 1650 CE because we've got rapier fighters and we love our rapier fighters. You can be whatever gender you gender you prefer, uh, which means even if you identify as female, you may have a male gender. Likewise, if you identify as male, you can have a female persona and you can switch back and forth. You can have multiple personas. Uh, I have a friend, Maestro Giuseppe, a lovely lady, her persona, she sings. She sings beautifully. Well, there are very few time periods in the SCA where there were professional female singers. And most of those were of very low repute. So the persona she picked was a male castrato in late period. And that's why she, that is her particular reason for picking a male persona. And when uh, she and her husband got pregnant, she switched personas into Maestro Giuseppe's no good sister. And he went off to his country villa for a year to stay away from her and let her live in the townhouse in her secondary female persona. That was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. <laughs> But you can do, uh, I have a 14th century male persona that I've been working on because I wanna pursue a line of uh, professional hunting, which females just didn't do in any time period. So there's no uh, rule on what your gender has to be. You can be whatever mar marital status you want if you are married and your spouse just is not interested in playing, you can have a, you can be single, unmarried, widowed, whatever, whatever works for you. You don't have to uh, keep what you're married. You can create your own family relationships. You can be from whatever walk of life you want to be with one caveat is everybody as you join the SCA is considered to be the younger child of minor nobility. And that means that you will be addressed by courtesy as my lord or my lady. And you are assumed to be well brought up enough to attend court. However, if you decide to be, you can be a peasant, you can be a merchant, you can be a blacksmith, you can do anything you want up to the level where you cannot presume a higher status than minor nobility until you receive a, uh, an award, the SCA awards, which I'll get to a little bit later. And if you are part of a household or your family all plays, you do not have to have the same persona in, in time and period and culture that they do unless you want to. So if you're a whole bunch and everyone you go camping with is 10th century Norse, 
and you want to be a 16th century Venetian, go with it. You don't all have to have the same backstory. The few restrictions, and this is the one I kind of touched on a moment ago, you cannot claim any titles other than those of, uh, awarded by an SCA crown, which means as soon as you get your AOA, you are then a lord or lady. You get a grant and you become an honorable lord, an honorable lady. And there's a whole long list of cultural appropriate titles. And I know they're working on some non-gender specific titles. I have a grant of arms and I have opted for Madame instead of Honorable Lady because I'm a persona geek and that's much more appropriate to almost any time period with a name like Marguerite. Okay, um, there's a hand up in the chat from Heidi. Are you, uh, uh, is your hand up for a question? Oh. Okay, uh, if you guys want to take yourself off of mute, feel free to answer, ask questions. I normally run this as a con, as a uh, more of a uh, discussion. I, I think I accidentally put my hand up when I was renaming myself. Sorry okay. about that. No worries. <laughs> no problem. You may not take the name or identity of any real historical person which you cannot be Richard the Lionheart, Elizabeth Tudor, William Caxton, Louis the Young, anybody who has actually existed. You can't take the name or identity of a mythical feature, mythical figure. Sorry, it's been a long day. Uh, you can't be Odin Allfather, you can't call yourself Ares or Venus. And this includes, you can't be a fairy, ogre, elf, troll, you have to be a people, you have to be human. And you cannot take the name or identity of a fictional character. So no Robin Hoods or Maid Marians. However, now having said that, you can model yourself, your, your persona after a real historical figure. I mentioned a William Caxton earlier. He was the first person to bring a movable type printing press into London and set up shop as a bookseller. And he was actually granted a uh, purveyor to the king title by I think it was Edward IV, I won't swear to that. And after he passed away, his daughter took over the shop. So if you wanna make yourself a printer in London, at that time period and have very similar backgrounds, background to William Caxton, that works really well. If you wanna become a female printer, we know that Elizabeth Caxton did this and she even kept her maiden name, which I don't know in that time period women did or not. So there, the history is full of people with very interesting lives and it's perfectly all right to style yourself with a similar background. You just have to make certain that you don't use their name in every little detail. Also, personas aren't forever, or they can be. If you decide that you have learned enough about a certain persona and you change your mind and you don't want to be 16th Vene century Venetian and you want to be a 14th century Scotsman or Scotswoman, you can do that. You can totally change your name and your persona, or you can develop a secondary persona. Uh, I started off doing 12th century Norman Welsh. I am currently also now working on a 10th century Icelandic woman, a 14th century woman, just because, oh my God, I bought this hat I absolutely love it and I need something to go with it. That's the other thing is there is very few, you do not need a persona to be in the SCA. The minimum rules for, for coming to an event are an attempt at pre-1650 clothing, 
pay your gate fee and sign the waiver. That is all you need to come to an event. Persona is what adds the fun, part of the fun to the SCA. When you have a lot of people walking around in all their different clothing and the more realistic and well-researched the clothing is, the better the atmosphere is. And people acting and portraying themselves in a uh, manner that's part of a culture different to you know, 21st century West Coast America. That's part of what we do the SCA for, at least I do, is it's just a completely different place to be. And that adds to the getting away from modern life. That's why a lot of people refuse to even talk about what they do modernly. They don't want, they don't want to talk about their job. They don't want to talk about, you know, car trouble. They don't want to talk about their kids' school. They just want to have fun for the weekend and go out and hit their friends or shoot arrows or learn to make cheese or spin things or just sit down and visit with their friends, hang out on the, by the war field and have lunch. And persona adds to all of that. It's the pavilion, the, the canvas pavilions or the well thought out camouflage of very modern tents. This is, this is all part of persona. So feel free to, if you decide you want to do something different, uh, either abandon totally what you're doing or develop something secondary. Tanique, our moderator, has, I believe, three different personas. And I may be wrong, there may be more. Uh, three main ones, yeah. Three main ones. Um, I'm working on four, although they all have similar names because I'm terrible with names and I don't want to have to put my friends through the agony of having to remember a different name every time. But you can have a completely different name and either ignore it if somebody addresses you by the wrong name or very politely remind them that when you are in this garb that you are you know, whatever your name is. I have um, on the handouts that were offered is one of the ones I had out was, was this one which isn't gonna show up because my camera is freaking out. Anyway, it's things to know about persona development and it's just that short list of rules if you want to use that. I also have a uh, persona questionnaire, which the things, if you're developing a persona, there's a lot of things to learn about a person because a persona is your adopting the dress and mannerisms of a person from a given time and place and culture. And the more deeply you want to get involved in it, the more you need to know. And for a lot of people, their whole interest, interest in persona is wearing a really cool outfit and finding a name and that's all they want to do. And that is okay. There's nothing at all wrong with that. I'm just a serious persona geek. Part of it's because there's so many things I want to know and learn about that it was easier to dive deep into one person's knowledge than it was trying to learn everything about everybody. So this list has a whole bunch, has all the information you want, want to know about a persona. Not every question is pertinent to everybody because some places and sometimes uh, if you live in Iceland, one of the questions here is who's your king? Uh, they didn't have ice, they didn't have kings in Iceland. Uh, 
who is the Pope? Well, if you live in any of the pagan areas, you don't know, you don't even know what a Pope is. You don't know who he is, you don't know what he does. But it's just a long list of things to consider and information to potentially look up. Uh, it starts off with your name. Do you have a question about, uh, I'm just gonna quickly, um, no. I sent out an email, there was a question about how you get a copy of it. I sent out a, an email uh, requesting that if you wanted to copy beforehand to email me. Um, you can always email me afterwards and I'll send you a copy of it. Um, I don't know how to um, link it to the chat, unfortunately. I tried that earlier and I couldn't make it work. Well, if you can't make it work, I certainly can't. I did that once and I'm not certain how I did it. <laughs> Pure dumb luck, I think. Okay, yeah. Anyway, yeah, if you want a copy of it, just email me and our, our, our Pick me on uh, Messenger and I'll send you a copy. Oh, what, what is your occupation? And by occupation, I mean, what is it your persona does? Um, are they a peasant who keeps the house and takes care of the kids while your husband is out in the field? Although chances are you'd also be out in the field a great deal of the time. Are you the uh, chatelaine of a manor? Are you an alewife, a widowed alewife, who uh, that's what she does for a living is she brews ale and sells it to whoever happens by. Are you a blacksmith? Are you a tinsmith? Are you a weaver, an embroiderer? What, because all this has to do with what you will wear, how you will live, if you're a wealthy merchant, you're going to have a nicer place to live. You're going to have better furniture. You're going to have more clothes. If you're a fairly prosperous uh, peasant, and there were some very prosperous peasants, you might have a couple of horses, um, a house with two rooms, maybe three. Uh, a nice garden, a bunch of chickens and geese and some pigs. Um, it, it varies d dramatically and those are things to, to consider. What, when were you born? And for a lot of people, they didn't talk about the year per se. They were born in the uh, 37th year of the reign of Henry the first of England. And that's how they count the years. First year of his reign, second year of his reign, third year of his reign. You might be have born in the, the year that the, the comet was seen in the sky. Uh, you might have been born in the year of uh, Battle of Angicourt. And that's all you know. You were born the same year that Angicourt happened. Because you have to remember that your persona is not going to know everything you know. They're going to know what's available for them to know and they're gonna know what they're interested in because they may not care who the next king in the next country is. Not if it doesn't have any bearing on their life. Are you married? How old were you when you got married? Any kids? Are they grown? Are they little? Do you take care of your elderly parents? Do you take care of your spouse's elderly parents or a maiden aunt? Are uh, your children living with you and raising their children with you? What does your spouse do? And what are the, and then you can go a little deeper. What are the names of your children? Uh, my children, I have mundanely three sons. My persona has three sons. My kids are Alex, Sean, and Patrick, but in, in the SCA, they're uh, William, Robert, and Leo because their middle names, their first names actually, are, are, they go by their middle and first names in the SCA because they're very period, uh, very period names. And for my convenience, 
I keep them their mundane age. That way I don't have to worry about forgetting anything. But you can decide you don't want to have kids or you can make up children. It is, that is part of the fun of the SCA is you can imagine or investigate a life other than your own. Bonjour, Lucy. Where do you live? What kind of surroundings do you live in? Do you live in a town? Do you live in a city? Do you live in London or Paris or Heidelberg? Do you live in Rome? Do you live in just in a small town just outside any of these cities? Do you live in the countryside? Do you live in a small hamlet of, of three houses? Do you live in a little bit larger town that has a nice little church that people come from the various areas to go to church on Sundays and other occasions? Or do you just live in a, uh, do you live in a manor house that's off in the field someplace away from the nearest town? Is the nearest town a half a day's ride away? Hey, Lucy's or got her hand up. Walk. Pardon? Lucy's got her hand up. Yes, you can unmute and talk. Yeah. Uh, am I am I muted? No, you're not muted. Oh, excellent. Thank you. I think it's an opportunity to explore sometimes a question of where would you like to live? If you're in an apartment in a large city and you've always wanted to live in the country by a stream, you can explore that through the SCA and through your persona development. And um, as I mentioned earlier, there's, there's a many, many reasons for picking a persona. I originally picked the 12th century because I was camping with, the, with two boys, seven and eight. And it was a clothes that I could get into quickly, easily before they got up and started heading out. Because there's nothing to lace up, nothing to button, nothing to tie. The tunics are loose enough that up and over the head, on goes the belt, and I'm ready to keep up with the, with the little beasties. I since found out a lot of really great things that I love about the 12th century. My husband ended up Norse because the clothes looked comfortable. Other people end up in one person or another because they get invited uh, to a, uh, a cooking event and they start learning about a cuisine from Southern Germany in the 14th century and they think this is great and they become a 14th century Southern German. They fall in love with, I said, they fall in love with clothes. You fall in love with a part of a culture, uh, the literature. One of your friends happens to be ninth century Norse and he, that sounds like a great idea, you know? And it is, it's a great idea to do that if it appeals to you. And, and you can start off one way and, and switch gears and do something else. And some of us have taken a long way around to finding their persona. Yes, I'm looking at you, Lucy. Some of you, some of us like me, I walked right into it right away. And your persona can change over time. My persona started off as a merchant. Uh, and then I got an AOA and went into the sergeantry, which means I'm in service to a baron and baroness. Uh, and so I became a lady and I got a small piece of territory in a little tiny manor house. And then I got a grant of arms and now I'm a much finer lady with a larger manor house and I'm keeping my persona up with my SCA titles because that's given me a chance to explore different aspects of it. Other people can end up being a Duke or Duchess and still maintain their persona as a merchant or as a typesetter. And that is perfectly all right. I said the rules are, are 
really few and far between. And when you decide what you're living in, what's your geography like? What's the land like around you? When you get up and you walk out your front door, what do you see? Is it flat and swampy? Is it mountainous? Is it rolling hillside? Do you look out on a town that before you step out, you're going to look overhead to make certain nobody's throwing a, a, a basin of slop out the window? And yes, they did that. They did throw buckets of slop out the window. Uh, you know, where do you live? What does it look like? Do you, uh, you know, if you throw open the window and take a deep breath of fresh air, is it fresh air? Is it sea air? Is it stinky downtown Paris in London? Is, are you living by the, near the uh, tanneries? What, what's your, what are your surroundings like? Uh, lands, titles, holdings, do you have any? Do you have any titles? Do you own, have lands? And who do you hold them from? Do you hold them from a monast from a uh, monastery? Because monasteries and churches had lots of land and they had tenants. And they were like, they were uh, the overlords to these tenants, just like a, a mighty baron or a prince would be. But uh, do you, what, what is your religion? Everybody had a religion. Everybody had, even if they themselves didn't believe, they had a religion. Uh, medieval society as a whole, for the most part, was intolerant of people who did not believe. Whether it be Norse or Jewish or Eastern Orthodox, Catholic, uh, later Protestant, uh, any of the East, Eastern religions I don't know enough about, and I understand that they have traditionally been more tolerant, but you still had something, some religion in your life, whether you believed it or not. And yes, if you were a closet pagan, you can be a closet pagan, but remember, you still went to church because if you were living in uh, 14th century Germany, they were not tolerant of pagans, which means you had to be good and be seen to go to church. If you lived in a city, what church did you go to? Large cities had churches every so often, and you lived in a parish. If you live in a small hamlet, you may just go to the church in the next town over, which may be a mile away. You may live, you may, all you may have is a priest. You may not really even have much of a church. It may be a single, small, one-room church that the priest lives in a hut out back. You may be in a cathedral town with a monastery, excuse me, and a cathedral and a convent and all the bells and whistles. And you're going to find everything in between. Do you have a patron saint? A lot of people claim to patron saint. If you're Welsh, it's probably St. David, but there's a bunch of Welsh saints too that uh, you might claim. What kind of education do you have? Everybody had an education. It may not have been a classic school like we think of as reading and writing and arithmetic, but you learned your trade. How did you learn your trade? What's your education? Were you apprenticed? Do you live in a city and your, your parents are part of a guild and so you apprenticed off? Uh, did you learn weaving from your parents? Are you a miller and you learned how to run the mill from your, from your father? 
what what is your education did you learn to read different times and places uh formal education was available a lot of times the village priest would teach children the basics of reading so they at least could sign their names or not uh 12th century Wales, uh, education among women, literacy was really crazy high among the upper class women, as was it in France and England, because that's when the romance novels got a hold. The Song of Roland and a whole bunch of Arthurian legends became very, very popular because there was an educated, literate class of women who knew how to read them. And so they started writing them down. Uh, think about your family tree when you, the, and these steps are as you get deeper into it. As I said, you may be very satisfied with a really spiffy outfit and a registered name. And again, that's cool. Cover your eyes, Lucy, or you cover your ears on that. So what year is it? Who is your family tree? What are your parents' names? Do you have any brothers or sisters? Uh, any that are still living? Are your parents living? Have you had any children? If so, how many and are any of them still living? Did they make it to adulthood or toddlerhood? Um, after you, you reach that, you start looking at the world around you. Who is your monarch? And you may consider your monarch to be, uh, a, I'm using this in a broader term, your clan chief maybe the elder in your village, because some places as we know, such as Iceland, they didn't have kings and queens. They really didn't have lords per se. They had the elders. If you live in a uh, place of the monarchy, who is the monarch? Is it a prince? Is it a king? Is the Pope your monarch? Who is the supreme head of your church? Or does your church have a supreme head? Again, uh, the Catholic church does. The Protestant church didn't, unless you're in England. Uh, the uh, Greek Orthodox had a patriarch. Do you even care? Do you know? You may not know who the Pope is, especially in the time when there were like two or three opposing Popes. And you might not really care. But who is you, who immediately do you answer to? Who is your immediate overlord? Who has the right to come on your property and require uh, duties from you? Whether it be helping with the harvest or helping with the sowing or the calving, or you know, coming to when when uh, war comes, they can call on you to provide arms or yourself or a son to fight. Who is your immediate overlord? And it might be an abbot or prior. As I said, a lot of monasteries had a lot of land, and Theoretically, they were supposed to be very unworldly. In reality, they had to be worldly because they had to deal with the politics of the time. Well, and so what kind of obligations do you have? Do you have to give a percentage of your crop? Do you have to serve 10 days out of the year in a military capacity or 40 days out of the year? Do you have to provide two people for, you know, help up at the castle? 
everybody owed every, somebody something, unless you happen to live out in the middle of the woods. And most people didn't live out in the middle of the woods. What kind of wars do you remember from your lifetime? What have you lived through? Because wars affect what goes on around you. It affects who your overlord is. It affects the attitudes of the people around you. Uh, if you live in a French village during the Hundred Years' War, your attitude is going to be a whole lot different than if you live in the middle of England during the reign of Henry II, which was very, very stable. You're going to have a, a completely different outlook on everything because in one, you can plan ahead and you can be relaxed. And if you see people ride a troop riding down the road, you don't have to suddenly start hiding all of your stuff and run for the hills because it's just the king's barons heading off someplace in a cloud of dust. But if you're in, you know, Western part of France, when England and France are in continual battle and war, you see people, an armed troop coming for you, into your area, you're going to grab your family, grab your movables, and hide if you can. Or you're going to seal up your town as best you can. So any wars around you do have a perspective on your persona. Were there any crusades that took place? Because crusades affected life. They affected uh, your culture. Were you in a time and a place of an inquisition? And inquisitions happened not just in uh, Spain, we, we know that one, everyone's heard about the Spanish Inquisition, but there were inquisitions that happened in France. They happened in areas in Italy, in south of Germany. Um, What does, did any disasters happen during your lifetime? For Marguerite, the year she was born, there was what the Chronicles called a great moraine of cattle, which means some cattle got sick and it wiped out lots and lots of cattle. It was a die off. That's a big thing. Uh, were you, did you live through an earthquake? Did the earthquake topple buildings? Uh, was there a major flood that, that wiped out part of your town? The Great London Fire, did you live through the Great London Fire? That is part of your persona. What legal system do you live under? If you're Irish or Scottish or Welsh, your legal system is different than if you're French or German. They use the Roman legal system, which is very much like our criminal court. You do something wrong, you go to jail, or they lop off a hand, or you're punished. Uh, I, I believe that the Norse also, and the Saxons, early Saxons, used a similar form to the Celtic, and that is if I wrong, I can see Hannah's face, so I'm gonna to talk to Hannah. If I do something that wrongs Hannah, I owe her a fine. I need to pay her off in pigs or horses or grain. And if I think that, if I loan Heidi a horse and she brings back the horse and the horse is lame, Heidi then owes me the use of a horse until that horse gets better. And she has to pay for any treatment. It's 
much more like our modern civil courts in that it's not uh, a criminal investigation. It's, uh, it's a tit for tat thing. And Kevin, if you want to ask anything, uh, anybody who wants to ask a question, just unmute and, and ask a question. Hi. So, oh, sorry. That's okay. I normally run this as kind of a discussion. And so this is really weird for me to, and if you could put a picture up or let me see you because yeah, it's always nice to see people. Hi, Heidi. Aban? Yeah. Hi. Wait, you had a question. Yeah. Uh, how would a lands connect do in this situation? Like, what would a lands connect, like, I want to try a lands connect drummer, like 16th century German. Cool. They have some of those outrageous costumes I, garb I have ever seen in my life. And it would be great. It's a wonderful persona. It's very, it's very popular in different places. Uh, many of them are mercenaries. One of the best ways to get started, if you're interested in a certain persona, is find somebody who you know that, or you've seen that does it. You don't even have to know them. The beauty of the SCA is if you walk up to somebody and ask them, hey, I really like your garb. I would like, I think I'd like to be a Lands Connect. They will tell you all about it. People in the SCA, we want to talk about our stuff. We really, really want to talk about our stuff. And it's harder to get us to shut up and stop talking about it than it is to get us to talk. <laughs> ah, that's why I, I want to be a Lands Connect drummer. Yeah soon, like 16th century German drummer. I remember seeing some Lance Connect stuff a long, probably a long time ago. I think someone was a drummer too. They had the, like one of the emblem of the Holy Roman Empire or something like that. Or I, I can't confirm that. I, I have, other than looking at their, their really cool outfits, I know very little about the Lance Connect. I know their time frame. I know where they come from, and that is pretty much what I know about Lands Connect. Hmm. But what about um, Ottoman Turkish? I want to try that too, and Roman too. Like first awesome. century Roman. You can be. You came in a little bit late. You can have as many personas as you want. Uh, one of the reasons I met picked Marguerite Fitzwilliam is I can carry that name from the ninth century up till today. And it wow. can be anywhere in Western Europe. And we're talking actually Byzantium, the Middle East. During the 11th century, the Crusades opened up Outdreamer, which was the kingdom around Jerusalem. So I can hold this name all the way from uh, the Middle East to the farthest point in Portugal, which is the farthest Western point in Europe. Uh, so, but you can have other names. You can have a different name with every outfit you wear if you want to. You're allowed to register, officially register two names but that doesn't mean those are the only ones you can go by. You can use as many names as I said, if, you're, if your persona are as different as you're talking about being, I would come up with a different name for each persona. But that's me. I think that's interesting. Oh, sorry. Um, Oh, well, when I joined uh, the SCA, I had always thought I was going to be early Icelandic. And then this Swiss woman came out of me, uh, sort of took over and became my, my first persona. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that I can explore the Icelandic one when I'm done exploring the Swiss. 
Yeah, I've got, I don't really even have a name for her. I've got 10th century Icelandic woman. Um, I've got a 14th century Welshman who's been transplanted into County Foix. Uh, goes by Michelle de Gav, which is Michael the Welshman, but that's not really his name. But that's what has been registered because that's what the people around him call him. His name is actually Meredith Ap Willem, but they don't call him that because that's a weird name and he's been living and working down there for most of his life since he was a young man. So he's Michael the Welshman. Uh, and that name I've actually registered. So I actually have two registered names, one male, one female. Uh, but, you know, so you can, you can try all kinds of different things. And you may go through a couple persona before you figure out that you really like this one. This, this is the one you feel comfortable in and it, it meets all your needs. It's, it's, you know, you're the right age, you're comfortable with the culture. Yeah, you know, etc. There's. Oh, know, that's a question I have. Part. Pardon? So is is your persona? Is it? It's not stuck in one period of time. Like, uh, if I'm who I am ten years ago, I'm like who I am in the SCA ten years later. Like, does time? It varies. Is it up to me? It is up to you. Oh. Um, <laughs> I actually have finally, except for a long time, I lived in 1871 or 18. Excuse me, 1181. Well, that's when I did my golden swan and all these things. And I have let time slide a little bit now. I'm, I'm later in, in time period. But I have a friend that every year he takes a look at what happened in his time period that year. So he get, as he gets a year older, he moves ahead a year in history. And that's his his thing is he he actually uh, goes ahead in time. Other people pick a, a year and they stay with they stay in that year no matter how old they are. It is all up to you. There's no right or wrong way to do it. That's that's one of the things I think is so fun is you can you can try all kinds of things. And I said, and if you get bored with it, stop. Do something else. Be somebody else for a while. And I keep looking at your picture, and I'm sorry, not looking at the camera. I'm not real good. I'm not real good at the whole camera thing. I am so sorry. Uh, where, can, can get back just a little bit, where does your stuff come from? If you live in a major city, it's easy. You go to the market. That's where you get your stuff. You go to the fish market to get fish. You go to the butcher to get your meat. You go to the weavers to get your cloth. Uh, if you have the money, you go to the spice merchants to get your spice. But if you live off the beaten path, uh, how do you get your stuff? Uh, are there peddlers that come by? It does the local abbey or town have a fair once a year where all merchants from all over the place come and, and you can buy all kinds of fabric and trim and spices and needles and axes and pins and all the things you can't make. Uh, how much of your food is local? Very few people were totally self-sufficient. Even large manors had things they couldn't grow. Uh, if you're up north, you are not gonna grow wheat. You have to buy your wheat or you just plain old don't eat any. You can grow rye, you can grow oats, but you're not gonna grow any wheat. Uh, if you live up north, if you live down south or on the Mediterranean, you're not gonna get cow's milk unless you're really lucky and really wealthy. 
because cows need lots of grass and they need it to be able to last out the year. You know, you can put hay aside, you know, you, you can, uh, and you did, you harvested hay, but it wasn't very efficient to feed, you know, that many cattle and horses on hay. So you had to figure out what you were gonna keep for the year. And you may not have had cows at all. You may have had a couple of goats that you got your milk from and a yard full of geese and chicken, which are easy keepers and gave eggs as well as being able to be eaten themselves. Uh, you may not have had, may not have had the money, pardon me, my chair is on my skirt. The joys of modern technology. Uh, you may not have had any spices. You may not have been in a place where you could buy spices. You may not have been in a social socioeconomic group where you could afford to buy spices. You needed salt. So how did you get your salt? Did you buy it from passing merchants? And there's always some traveling merchant and they may be dragging along a horse or a donkey laden with barrels or dragging a cart full of barrels of salt or salted fish. Uh, they may have, you know, they may, and traveling merchants brought all kinds of things. They even brought barrels full of live fish to stock fish ponds. Although they're less likely to do that if they didn't know ahead of time there was going to be a market for them. But people inland who had the money uh, to afford to create a fish pond, they needed, it getting, needed it to get stocked. And so there'd be people arriving with barrels full of live fish. Um, so part of what's available to you, what do you grow or create yourself? What do you trade with your neighbors? Uh, you, may, you may have wool and you may trade it with somebody in the next town who is a weaver. And you may get a little bit of fabric back as, in trade for your wool and they can take the rest of the wool and they can sell it. There's, there's as many varieties as, the, as, you can, as you can come up with. What do you know who the countries nearest to you are and who's their monarch? How do they affect you? Uh, if you live on the west coast of France or the east coast of England, you know England and France. You know the other country. You probably know who the king is because there has been cross channel traffic both commercial and political for hundreds and hundreds of years. So you're aware of that country. You may not be aware really of Italy or Spain. Perhaps yes, perhaps no, perhaps they're just a story. That you know there's a country out there uh, named Galicia. You don't know anything about it. You don't even really know where it is, but you know it exists. You, you may have heard of Venice. Again, you may not know anything about it, or you may know that Venice is where you buy, where you, that uh, really pretty dye comes from that costs so much money in the shop down on the corner. That may be all you know about it. Or where that pretty, glass goblet that you keep looking at as you walk past the, uh, the goldsmith shop that he has sitting out so that people can see it. And so he can show how wealthy he is because he's such a good goldsmith. And you heard that, and he told you it came from Venice. That may be all you know about Venice is that's where that glass goblet came from. But you have heard from about things, unless you live out in the woods. Uh, traders who come by with their laden horses 
have information, you know, they tell you about these things, the places they get stuff. Okay, it has been an hour. Does anybody want a break? We, let's take a, a couple minute break here so that I can get something to drink. Thank you for this class, by the way. Well, you know what I said about talking to, getting people started in the SCA, talking about things that they really love? Yeah. This is this is one of my things. So it's fun. And I also use I've also been a teacher, so it's kind of a twofer. So sit back, relax. I'm gonna mute for a moment. Yeah, I was just going to comment that if there's a particular um, culture that you're interested in, you can probably find an SCA Facebook group that's related to it. Um, also, too, depending on your area, um, if you have a specific area, you can probably, um, well, we can talk about it at the end, but um, there's a there may be someone in your area that we can turn you on to that, that might be able to help you with that, too. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the chance to, to stretch it around a little bit. Let me know when you're ready to go on, continue. No, I'm on the keyboard. Oh. 
Okay, it's been five minutes. Is everybody back? Unmute and say hello or wave at me or something. Kelly, the kitty is Freya, also known as Demon Spawn. Wait for a couple more hellos. Freya quit striking. She seems to have decided that the leather chair is the place to scratch. Okay, well, off we go. Something else to consider is places you have been. It's a common myth that people in the Middle Ages never went more than five miles from home. And that just isn't true. It, depending on when and where you are, you could have traveled extensively. Uh, during the 12th century, because it was rel late 12th century, because it was relatively peaceful, pilgrimages were a real thing. And it wasn't just a pilgrimage because you did something wrong. It was sightseeing. Also, if you went on pilgrimage, you got your taxes abated for the year that you were gone. So that a man could leave his wife and children at home and they could continue to bring in the harvest as best they could, but you weren't taxed. Um, you couldn't be called up for war. Any legal uh, issues you had going had to be abated until you were back. But there, there was a chain of inns. I mean, there were travel instructions. If you were in London and you wanted to travel to Mont Saint-Michel or Santiago de Compostela, there were pamphlets on the route on how to get there. The inns along the way the best places to see along the way. A lot of pilgrims, you have the image of the pilgrim in sackcloth and ashes, walking barefoot with a staff and all his worldly goods in a bag and a blanket slung over his shoulder. There were people that traveled in wagons. There were people who traveled on horseback or donkey back or mule back that traveled in large parties. Uh, they pretty well partied all the way. I think Chaucer and and Tanique can tell me if it's just so had stories. I think the whole Ch Canterbury Tales was stories about a party going on pilgrimage to Canterbury. The routes were patrolled so they were safe to travel because the local lords wanted to keep them safe because. Pilgrims brought money into town because they came through your town and they were going to stop in your inn. They were going to buy provisions. They were going to eat in the tavern. They were going to buy new shoes. There were souvenir shops. I went uh, a couple of years ago to Mont Saint-Michel, which was a major pilgrimage site. And in the, it, it currently has its, uh, what it looked like in the 12th, uh, excuse me, in the 14th century, I believe. As you walk up this narrow, windy road inside, there are tourist shops all up and down the first section of it. T-shirts, keychains, coffee cups, thermos bottles, out garden banners, 
notebook, you name it, if they could brand it Mont Saint Michel, they did or do. But the same thing was true in the 14th century as in now. They just sold different souvenirs. And they had the same signs hanging out. They would sell saints medals. They would sell, you name it, if they could figure out how to sell it to you as a souvenir, they did. Pilgrimages, depending on where you're at, were big business. And a lot of people traveled. So, and you may have regularly gone to London every other year. Maybe you uh, wanted to make certain you took your cattle to London to sell them. Or there's a certain spices that local peddler wouldn't bring. And so you would go to London or Bristol or York someplace big where you could get them. It wasn't, just, and somebody were, some people were uh, serial pilgrimage, pilgrims, if they would go to every pilgrimage they could find, little or, you know, big saint or little saint. Have you met anybody famous? You know, did, were you a gardener in uh, one of the palaces and met a Leonardo da Vinci? Were you an apprentice to him? Did he teach you how to paint? There's a persona for you if you're a painter. Um, but some of the main things to think about is what do you do during a day? What does your daily schedule look like? When do you get up? When do you eat breakfast? I mean, do you get up and you have chores that you have to do? Do you have to go out and milk? milk the cows or milk the, uh, the sheep or the goats first thing in the morning? Do you go to mass before you have breakfast? Do you have breakfast first? What is your typical breakfast? And it varied from place to place. It varied from culture to cult culture. A lot of times breakfast was leftovers from what you had the night before. Uh, then as now, Porridge or hot cereal was a very popular breakfast because it stuck with you during the day. What did you do in the morning? Are you a shopkeeper? And so you went out and you opened your shop and made certain everything was organized. And you, got, you corralled all your apprentices and told them what they needed to do for the day. Or did you take a little time to, to say, OK, this, this is the skill you're going to learn today. And you showed them what to do that day. You showed them something new. Are you a teacher? Did you sit down and, and teach your pupils something? Are you the lady of a manor and you rounded up all your 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 ladies and make set them to sewing altar sewing on altar cloth or making shirts? What did you do in your morning? What did you, uh, when time did you eat your lunch, your midday meal? And what did you call it? Was it called lunch? Was it called dinner? Was it called supper? Was it first breakfast or second breakfast? You know, and what did you eat? Was it your big meal of the day and that's when you ate most of your food? Or was it something that you ate quickly so you could get back into your shop? And what did you do in the afternoon then? Was the afternoon the day, the time that you set aside to work on weaving? Or you set aside to make nails if you're a blacksmith? The afternoon was, your, was where you made spikes and nails. What, what does your afternoon look like? Is it different than your morning? Or is it the same thing you did all morning, but you just stopped and ate something? When did you eat your evening meal and what did you eat? Was it your big, again, was it your big meal? Uh, and what did you do in the evening? Did you keep working? Or like many people in the Middle Ages, after dinner, you got together with the people you lived with and you told stories and you entertained each other. You pushed things out of the middle of the room because 
your grandfather had a uh, a little harp, and he would plunk tunes out, and everybody would dance. Or your grandmother had a uh, recorder, and she would play music, and you'd dance. Or you'd take turns telling stories, or would you play games? What did you do in the evening? You know, there were some people that after dinner, they turned, they, they put out the lights because they didn't have much light, and they couldn't afford even rush lights, and they would just go to bed. Other people, uh, especially up north during the summer, some, it's, it's light out till 10 o'clock at night. You know, so you may go down to the local tavern and meet with your friends and have a pint of ale. You might get together and, and hang over the fence with your neighbor and, and each of you have a drink and, and pass the time and talk about your kids and what the na- the other neighbor on the other side does and, and the stranger who came into town today. Or you think the baker is just shorting everybody. What do you do in the evening? What time do you go to bed? When it gets dark? A lot of people did. Many people did. If you had the money for candles or rush lights, you might have stayed up past dark. If you're wealthy, you certainly stayed up past dark because you could afford it. And if you're a member of court, oh, heaven, yes, you stayed up past dark because that's when all the... uh, Politicking happens. Amusement. What games do you play? There's lots of popular games. Indoor games, outdoor games. And adults play games that we consider children's games now. They play games like tag and blind man bluff and all all kinds of, of running and circle games. They played chess, they played backgammon. Later on in period, there's a variety of card games they play. Parcheesi. Parcheesi is a very, very old game. Bocce or bowls. Again, a very popular game and has been for centuries. Uh, Did you know any particular dances? Late periods are more likely to come up with dances you know that we know the names of. Early period, you did circle dances, or reels, or variation on a square dance. Did you play any instruments? A lot of people did. Uh, stories. We know uh, certain stories that existed. You may, if, if you're Saxon, you may have known how to the telling a Beowulf. You may have learned Beowulf from your grandfather, your grandmother, and you tell it to your grandchildren. Holidays, what holidays do you observe? The church had lots of holidays, special saints days and different uh, days on the calendar when things happen, like Pentecost. But there are other holidays. You may celebrate the king's birthday. There may be a holiday that that has been proclaimed to celebrate uh, their ascension to the throne. In England, still, they celebrate the Queen's birthday on a day that's not her birthday. It's a traditional day that I don't know how they picked it. Somebody picked it and decided this is her official birthday, and it's a national holiday. You know, you celebrate a a local holiday. You know, the the day that you drove off the Raiders, and, and you just celebrate that every day. What are, where do your clothes come from? I'm switching gears here. Where do your clothes come from? Where do you get the, what's available? Do you have wool? Do you have linen? Do you have silk? Do you have silk? You're lucky or you're rich. Most people had linen and wool. But do you grow the flax and process it yourself or do you buy the linen? Do you have sheep or do you buy the, the uh, wool as yardage? What colors are they? And something I have been informed of 
by a uh, somebody who specializes in dyeing that there are no colors available that, that we have today that can, except like no even neon I think they could get that cannot be could not be dyed in period. However, that doesn't run true for every place and time. So there may be a particular color you could get that could be dyed, like a certain pink, but you may not be able to get that where you are. You may have to buy that dye, which would be very expensive. Or you may just stick with colors that you can get locally. You can either buy the dye or you can make the dye. Uh, in England, there's Matter and Woad and a few other things. There's some lichens that can be turned into dye. I understand uh, somewhere around the north of England or Scotland is a particular lichen that makes a really good black. Don't hold me to that. I'm just kind of dredging that up from my memory. But there's all kinds of colors you can get. It just, how expensive is it? Is it local? And it may be local and cheap for somebody in the south of Spain. It may be crazy expensive for someone who lives in Norway. But take a look at what's available around you for what, uh, what you're going to be wearing. Uh, what's available to write on? You have to make something out of bark to write on. Can you write? Um, do you have to buy parchment or vellum? Are you in the Far East where they still make papyrus? What kind of wood's available for you to uh, build things out of? You know, is it oak? Is it pine? Is it maple? What kind of leather or fur is available to you? Uh, goat skin, sheep skin, cow hide, pig skin? Are you a place where you can hunt for fur? So you can get fox or beaver, or if you're someplace you can get wolf hide, or are you gonna be stuck with rabbit fur and and uh, you know something that's grown locally, sheepskin or something. What kind of fur? And that's based partially on how much money you have and do you live near a big city? Because if you live in Madrid, you can get furs that somebody in a little town in the south of France may not have access to. Because you live in a big city where people, merchants are going to import exotic things that may not be available where you, actually available where you live. What kind of stone is available for your buildings? Or well, if you have buildings, or you live in Ireland and everything is made of stone because the ground is made of stone, or do you live someplace where stone is hard to come by? What kind of metal is available? Tin, copper, bronze, brass, silver? Do you live someplace silver is being mined and so it's relatively easy to get? Or do you live far, far away and silver is very expensive because it has to be brought in? Think about what you wear. How many layers did you wear? I've got two layers on. And I'm probably scanting a layer, but this is my summer wear. Everybody, almost everybody wore at least two layers. You wore linen next to your body because linen is very durable and easy to wash and care for because linen gets softer as you wash it. It actually gets more comfortable as you wash it. And you'd wear your finer fabrics on the outside so that they would last longer so that your body oils wouldn't get them dirty. And that and wool itches. Wool has always itched. And unless you can afford the really fine wool, you don't want that up against your skin. You want to have a layer or two of linen. How many layers do you wear? What do they look like? What kind of undergarments do you wear? 
what overgarments? Do you wear a coat? Do you wear a cloak? Do you just wear an extra layer of the same thing you've got on underneath? Do you wear three or four layers of the same cut, just progressively larger? What kind of shoes do you wear or boots? Uh, belt pouches, jewelry, hairstyle, how do you wear your hair? Most people wear some kind of a head covering. To go without a hair, head covering, you're normally a young unwed woman, a, a teenage girl or a child. Most women, when they got married, would start binding their hair up <laughs> somehow in one braid or braids, fancy braids up around their head, hiding their braids, hiding their hair underneath a veil, or letting their long braid or braids hang out from underneath their, their veil and just keep the top of their head covered. Some people wear snazzy hats. Some people just wore veils. Some people wore extravagant headdresses made up of veils and wires and all kinds of fancy things that made it hard to get in through doors and made people keep their distance. Did you wear any cosmetics? Uh, what kind of weapons or armor were around you? Even though you're not a fighter, you've seen the fighters. What did they wear? The rich ones, the poor ones, you know, if you're poor, you may just wear a couple of really thick layers of linen and hope to God that protected you or have uh, wax hardened leather plates on it. Or you may have metal plates. You may have chain mail. You may have plate mail. You may use swords or axes. Most people had a, you had a knife because knives were tools. Knives weren't necessarily a weapon. What you cut your meat with, it's what you cut your threads with. It's what you use every day for a myriad of different things. How often do you bathe? And yes, most people bathe more than three times in their life. Some places, like there are German towns that had bathhouses. And that was a social get-together, as people get together at the bathhouse. Uh, the baths in Bath, England, were used for a long time before they kind of went out of style. Then they came back into style again. What kind of things are in your home? What kind of a home do you live in? If you're a peasant, you may just live in one room with all of your animals at one end and your family at another. Or they may live outside underneath a, uh, a lean-to that's been added on to your house. This is basically just a three just walls and a ceiling. You may, if you're a, a wealthy merchant, uh, you and your spouse certainly would have your own room. You would have a open eating and family area. You may have another room for all your children to stay in together. You may have another room for all your apprentices, or your apprentices may sleep in the shop, which is a great place because that way it keeps people from breaking in and robbing, robbing you. You have a barn where you can store hay and keep your keep your animals safe. What kind of bedding do you have? Do you have a bed? Or do you just all have pallets that get stacked up the next morning? Uh, do you have any tables? A lot of people only had one table. Some people only had a couple of what we would consider sawhorses and put a plank over it so you could move it. A trestle table. Did you have chairs? Did you have stools? Uh, Cushions. A lot of this is based on how rich you are and how available things are. If you're a sheep farmer, 
you might have a fair amount of uh, sheet pelt and sleep under those or make a cushion out of it. Or you may be so poor you have to just sell it every time you get it. You can't store it. Uh, what kind of tools? What, kind, what do you eat off of? Do you eat off a chunk of stale bread? Or do you have a wooden plate? Or do you have a ceramic plate? Do you have a pewter plate? Are you, are, do you have enough money to get pewter or really fancy? Uh, cook pots. Do you just have one pot that you swing over to the over the fire, or do you have do you have multiple pots? Uh, what's your heat source? Do you have a fire pit in the middle of the room, or do you have an honest to goodness fireplace in the in the side wall that has a chimney? If you have a pit in the middle of the room. You use your rafters as a smokehouse. You have a bunch of hams and sausages hanging from your rafters to stay nice and smoky so that in the middle of winter, you've got a source of meat. How do you store your food? Do you have barrels of, of dried fruit? Do you have uh, barrels of salted fish or salted meat? Or do you dry all of your meat and then put it in, in a basket someplace? Meat, food is hard to come by in the middle of winter because you're, you know, depending on where you live. You may live in a place you can have even grow cabbages and onions and have them all winter. You may live someplace where you've got to store everything from winter. You may live in the south of France where your vegetable garden runs all year round and you always have some sort of a vegetable or green to eat. So a, a long list of things to consider. And the next question is, oh my God, all that information, how am I supposed to figure this out? As has been mentioned before, thanks to Facebook, there are lots and lots and lots of specialized Facebook groups. They've got them 12th century, 11th century, every century, every culture. Lands Connect, Ottoman, Welsh, Scottish, Iberian in general, uh, Moorish. There is a group out there to give you the information now. My third uh, thing that I've got here, third handout, is research sources. Uh, there's a couple of links which I just double checked, so if you type them in carefully, they'll work. Uh, one is laurasdaughter.com. She's got some information on using the internet for research and documentation, basically helping you know what's a good site and what isn't a good site. Okay, the links are in the page. You can uh, send a message to Tanith, a direct message, and she will get the, pay the uh, handouts to you, Aben. Yeah, if you go back to the page um, that lists the class, um, just PM me and I'll send you a copy of it. Wait, who do I PM again? Uh, It'll be Joanne Burroughs. Oh, okay. And I sent these to her the other day. Um, a lot of these are ones that are that are good old uh, information. And I confirmed that all of the like that all of the uh, sources are current. I've got a list of stuff for the book detailing daily life, um, life in a medieval castle, life in a medieval city, life in a medieval village. Uh, Joseph and Francis Dees put out a series of what I call coffee table books. It's very general information but it's a good place to start. People will tell you, don't ever go to Wikipedia. Wikipedia, again, is a really good place to start. 
the best thing to do is find some information you like, go to the bottom, find the sources, and go to the sources. Um, what I can recommend myself, if you are interested in the 12th century, it's called Daily Living in the 12th Century. And the author took a um, memoir that was written by a fellow named Alexander Neckham, who wrote all kinds of information about his travels in France. And so he used those to create a picture of what daily life in the 12th century in Western France was like. But there's Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, which is a historical. Uh, I do have a published book here, but it's also available on the internet. Just uh, do a search for Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. The Doomsday Book. Again, that uh, there's lots of things written about it. It was a census that was gathered by uh, William the Conqueror. So it's called the Doomsday Book because all the people he conquered thought that he what he was doing was he was going to round all the, the information up and slaughter them all and take everything for himself. Uh, essentially, he just wanted to tax them. But it has all kinds of information about England and what shape England was in and what the villages, how big the villages were and what they grew. The next thing, and then what I really like best, uh, well, I'll go with the next one, is books about clothing. And this, is real, this, this list really just contains an overview, just some things. The internet has made the world of research explode. A lot of SDA people have some really good websites on clothing, LandsConnect clothing. Uh, Roman clothing, and those are the places I've always started. Uh, there's a series of books by uh, from the Museum of London, because they started digging along the Thames River a long, a long time ago now to shore up and and make uh, put some sewers in and put some put a seawall in. And they start finding stuff. They found lots and lots and lots of stuff. Uh, they found shoes. They found clothes. They found buckles. They found horseshoes. They found tools. You name it, they found it. And they put out books containing this information. They have one which is textiles and clothing from 1150 to 1450. And they show you. All the bits and a lot of the bits and pieces they found, they describe it. They tell you what they think it is. There's pictures of it. They tell you where they found it, how deep it was. They have one for shoes and patents. And for what, if you don't know, a patent was kind of like a wooden shoe, a wooden sandal that you'd wear over your shoes to keep you out of the muck and the dirt. So when you went inside, you just took the patent, you slipped your foot out of the patent, and you had to wear your shoes inside. Dress accessories, uh, which has brooches, rings, buckles, pendants, buttons, purses, is sent as over 2,000 items in that. Uh, there is a fabulous book that was actually a, a college thesis. Women's Costume and French Text of the 11th and 12th Century, which is available now in PDF form uh, through Google Books. And this woman in, I think it was like 1920, 1927 is the official uh, date year it went to press. She went through all of the, all of the romance novels, the romance that she could find in 11th and 12th century French and catalog all the mentions of clothing and describe what all these items were. It's kind of an amazing thing. But if you're not interested in 11th and 12th Western European, it's not you know, a waste of time. 
cat guinea hen here. Um, stepping through time, which is archaeological footwear from prehistoric times to 1800. Uh, again, it's wonderful. It shows all kinds of footwear from all over, uh, from the from the Netherlands, from can't draw on that, uh, from York, from northwestern Europe, uh, woven into the earth, uh, textiles from North Greenland. When they were excavating some areas in Greenland. There were some very old Norse settlements, and the people all—they all died out. But they found that they, their clothing had been beautifully preserved, and so woven into the earth has beautiful clothes that are so complete. You can see how it, uh, the fabric is put together. This, how the seams were sewn together. And there's a, follow, a partner book that uh, Medieval Garments Reconstructed where they published the patterns of these islands. No questions? Okay. Um, medieval uh, European jewelry, in the, which is from a catalog from the Victorian Albert Museum. And the Medieval Clothing and Textiles series. And these are peer-reviewed articles on very specific subjects. Here I quote volumes one through nine. I know that there are more volumes. They turn out a uh, new volume every year. And they're, uh, the, read the quote here, contents of each volume are selected to cover a broad geographic scope as well as a range of periods from early medieval to late Middle Ages. It also publishes short reviews of new books. Uh, they've got everything, well, something on almost everything. They talk about uh, what, what the nuns were wearing in 13th century Aryan Germany. Uh, they've got an article about uh, tablet weaving putting words in tablet woven belts. They have articles on shoes, on buttons. It's, a, it's an amazing uh, variety and array of different subjects. Reading books about uh, political and economic backgrounds is, is good. There's uh, commercial revolution of the Middle Ages. There's some famous ones, period books, the Book of the Courtier, uh, which was written in the Italian Renaissance. Uh, there's a book, The Republic of St. Peter, The Birth of the Papal State from 680 to uh, 825. But my favorite of all the books, the best things to study to build a persona are travelogues. Travelogues are amazing because you're getting a first-hand view of somebody from another area visiting. Uh, there's Agarius a Travels. Fourth century, uh, she was a Norse woman who went to the Holy Land. And so she described was well, like being a uh, pilgrim in Jerusalem 50 years after the reign of Constantine. And she paid lots of attention to detail. Uh, there's a book on uh, 19 first-hand accounts of Jewish travelers in the Middle Ages. The Vinland sagas in the 10th century, uh, that's all about the travels of Eric the Red and Leif Erikson. There is one called Far Traveler, The Voyages of a Viking Woman. And uh, it's Gudrid, who lived until uh, 1050. And she explored uh, the North America with, her, with two different husbands. 
And one of them was the brother of Leif Erikson. And she wrote books. Uh, one of my favorite ones uh, is written by Gerald of Wales, who was mostly Norman, identified as Welsh. And he wrote two travelogues. One was the travel through Wales that he did with one of a papal representative trying to uh, recruit people for one of the crusades. And another one is history and topography of Ireland where he accompanied one of the armies of Henry II into Ireland. The, his humor, he wrote it in Latin. It's been translated into lots of different languages. His humor comes through dramatically. He's a very snarky person, but he's also very observant. And remarkably even-handed in the uh, end of the journey through Wales and, and description of Wales, that's the other thing, he does an evaluation of Wales. He has a section on what the Normans need to do to conquer Wales. And what then he turns around and tells, you, tells the Welsh what they need to do to prevent the Normans from conquering them. In the meantime, his humor, he tells all kinds of funny side stories, uh, rumors, the travels of Marco Polo. Of course, keep it, you know, that with a grain of uh, salt, but you can read between the lines and, and you can. But you could understand what at that time period people were hearing. What were they hearing about the East? What were they? What did they know about it? Uh, there's a number of Crusades uh, chronicles from the Crusades. Uh, there was one written in the 13th century by uh, Jeanville. There's another one by Sir John, John de Mandeville from the 14th century. There's the 14th century Canterbury Tales, which was written for humor and, and entertainment. If, you're, uh, if you read it out loud, you might actually be able to read it in the original. I, I find 14th century English is okay as long as you're reading it out loud, because you have to hear it. But there are some really good translations into the modern. Uh, Jeffrey Chaucer was a, mem a member of court. He was part of the uh, English royal court. And there's rumors that he had been a spy and all kinds of different things. From the 14th century also, is the travels of Ibn Battuta, who traveled, who began a pilgrimage to Mecca that ended 27 years later and 75,000 miles later. And he traveled from Morocco, Southern Russia, India, China. He traveled all over the world that he could. Uh, the Chronicles of Foissard, again, is uh, War Chronicle, but he was in the thick of it. Um, Book of Marjorie Kemp, a 15th century woman who traveled. She was a brewery owner. Uh, four Voyages of Columbus. And you can read all about his travels and what he discovered. There's a book uh, by a 16th century Muslim travel. To, uh, Penguin Classics is a really good source for finding a lot of these books because they don't have a big audience. And so they're published for schools and academics. The translations on them are really very readable. They're not very expensive because most of these chronicles, once you get them in the modern type, aren't very big. And so you can buy them in a paperback a lot of times on uh, some of the used book uh, sites. Another great source is the SDA's own complete anachronism. 
If you have not seen any of these, there are a pamphlet about a small book about this. They're all single subjects. They are written by a member of the SCA uh, who has done a lot of research and is on all kinds of subjects on making different kinds of food, uh, weaponry, dance and music. They are, you can buy them. I have down here 450. I could not confirm the price because at this moment, the link on there uh, to the SDA store is valid, but it is down right now until the end of the month. So you go there and all you're going to get is the, I'm sorry, we're closed right now until August 31st. But you can buy a uh, copy of those. And they have almost copies of almost all the ones that have ever been written. We have about 10 minutes. Does anybody have any questions? Please unmute and, and ask. Talk to me. So which complete anachronist will I need at this point? You have, you'll have to go to the store, and they're all listed. The titles all have their subject on it. Do I need to be a member to get those or not? Nope. Bring in an account or what? Pardon? Do I need an account to buy them? Do I have to be a member? No, I, I don't think so. I think you can just uh, go, and I believe they have you pay through PayPal. Yeah, here. I'm not certain. It's been a few years since I have purchased anything from them, but it was a really easy thing to do. You go on to the website, and they've got all the titles, and you just click the little check mark, little box next to the title you're interested in, it totals it up at the bottom, and you're either going to pay with a credit card, or you they may have you may be able to send in a uh, check. I don't know about that. No, I it, I think they have a PayPal link, or you pay with credit card. Um, I just I bought a bunch of the ones that I don't have because they have sale before they shut down. It's been a few years since I've been on this, so but I know you can pay through by a credit card or through PayPal. And it's, it's really easy to buy it because I said all the titles are listed with a little box next to it and you just check the little box on everything you want to buy. And you don't have to be a member. It's, it's very simple and these are really well written. If they're still selling it, um, they also sell, used to sell the old Queen Carol's Guide. Um, which is good, and it's a good supplement to the um, to the um, volume that's the introduction to the SCA, which is a another good book that they have um, on the on the when the site is up at the end of the month. It's worth looking at. There is a Facebook group for on tier persona development. If anybody's interested, you do not have to be from on tier. I just set that up because I'm from on tier. Mm -hmm. But it uh, there's a couple basic questions I want you to answer, and they're really basic, like why you want to you know why do you want to be a member and what's your local branch? Because I didn't want a bunch of people who wanted to spam it and sell us razor blades and, and oddball stuff, and, and I want to know it's actually SCA people that. And we're, it's not very active, but we're always happy to answer questions, make recommendations. And as we said before, one of the best ways to find out to get started is see somebody who is doing something that you think is cool. They're wearing a wonderful Lens Connect outfit or they're cooking over an open flame or they're making something that you think is great and ask them. And I have said, they will be more than happy to tell you all about it, probably in exhaustive detail. Sometimes if you ask somebody about what they're wearing, they may say, oh, I didn't make this. But then they'll tell, they can tell you who did. 
And then you, and a lot of times they will go introduce you when you tell them how much you really love the outfit and they will take you over to meet the person who made their outfit and you can pick their brain. Just um, be, be cognizant at events. Someone may love to sit down and talk to you, but they might be busy and not have time. So, you know, be, be say, when do you have time to talk to me rather than like, like don't be put off if they're too busy at an event because quite often people have a lot to do. But yeah, usually they'll probably talk your ear off. Yeah, it's, it's every, because we're all love what we do, whether it's cooking or sewing or dyeing or carving wood or making things out of leather or hitting people with sticks or throwing sticks down range. We all love what we do. And we're always, most people are more than happy to tell you about what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that is, that too is one of the joys in the SBA is learning all kinds of things from all kinds of different people. Okay, are there any other questions? So uh, will this uh, be available for uh, reviewing like the recording or not? It will. Um, give it a few days. Um, Nergway would probably be the one to answer that question more than I could. He's the tech technical type. Um, I put a link back in the chat for student feedback if if people wouldn't mind filling that out. Um, so Thanks, Tanik. I welcome. filled that out already. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Heidi? Well, your, pick, your, your video just came back up. Well, I wanted to Say goodbye face to face. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm glad Very you nice. It. I hope you enjoyed it. Very much so. I've got lots of ideas and lots to think about. And I think I'll look for your persona group. I think that'd be interesting. Please do. I said, Ooh, what's Facebook your persona group? group? Uh, it's a Facebook group and it's just dedicated to persona development. Uh, there's nice. Two, all different, you know, Subjects, times, just uh, look for Facebook group. It's, it's on tier persona development. Thanks, I'll uh, well, see if that's available to join. Uh, yeah. Can I go ahead and join it? Yeah, please do. Just Is it public or private? I think they're all private now, Facebook yeah. groups. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and tier persona. Ah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank secret, all of you, you for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for coming and teaching us. <laughs> and um, I just wanted to let you know that next session will be September 2nd. <laughs> and that one will be, oh, uh, oh that'll be um, the camping, introduction to camping in the SCA with um, uh, Maminka the Bohemian. So that should be fun too. Oh. Um, and um, I gave the feedback link and um big big thank you to um marguerite for presenting thank you all right have a good night everybody yeah thank you bye-bye bye-bye thank you